Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We may have been told it ourselves, may have heard others say it, may even in a fit of anger said it ourselves, I'm going to make you eat your words. When we say that, when we hear that, we know what's up. Somebody doesn't like what someone else has been saying, and they're going to do something about it. It usually involves the threat of force, of violence, at least harsh words in return. But here, Jeremiah isn't talking about eating his own words. He's celebrating the fact that he gets to eat the Lord's words. After one of his litanies of complaint, he pauses and talks about what God has done for him. But before he starts talking about what God has done, he does do some complaining. And that, Jeremiah is just like us. Maybe not always the same situations and circumstances, but he could whine with the best of them. Of course, the target of his complaining was usually a little bit more severe than what we go through because he was dealing with a hostile audience who didn't want to hear God's truth and who throughout his ministry would threaten to banish him or to completely do away with him. They wanted to make him eat his words, even if they were the Lord's words that he was speaking. They didn't want to hear about their sins, about their shame, about God's judgment over their attitudes and their deeds. He's feeling kind of down, and it will happen again. So he asked God first to remember him, to visit him, to come to me and comfort me. And if that's not part of your complaining, then you either are complaining about something that doesn't deserve complaining, or you haven't finished your complaint, because just griping doesn't do it. Just griping, just grumbling. In fact, we hear in several places in the scriptures, including in some of Paul's writings, sort of implied even in today's reading from Romans. The attitude that we carry and the way we deal with others in life is part of this whole life of service, of love, of care, of concern for the others. Grumbling for the sake of grumbling whining and whimpering about those things that just happen. But Jeremiah is complaining because people aren't taking him seriously because that also they aren't taking the Lord seriously. And here he's asking that God get even, take vengeance for me, for those who are persecuting me. And you sometimes feel that too, don't you? I'm not going to hit them myself, but God, if you want to strike them with boils or Send down some lightning from heaven. I'm not going to complain at all. In fact, I'll sit back here with my popcorn and enjoy the show. That's our human attitude. And how much of that Jeremiah is carrying, we don't know. We can't look into his heart, but he seems to wear enough of his emotions on his sleeve that at least part of him wouldn't mind seeing the ground open up and swallow a bunch of Israel like it did in the wilderness. Or God sends some more serpents to bite some more Israelites. But God had done that already. He's on to other things. He's reminding God that when he opens his mouth and speaks God's word, he's doing it on God's behalf. It's for your sake that I bear reproach. And that's the only way that you should invite hatred on yourself also. By being a believer, by speaking and acting like a believer. If people hate you because you're doing hateful things, that's on you. If people hate you or don't want to associate with you because you are too nice, too kind, too loving, too caring, too caught up in the fact that Jesus is Lord and Savior of all, and that there is no other way to go to heaven, and that you would really like those people are hearing your words to join you in everlasting life, then it's on them. And he reminds God then what happened. You're 
Words were found and I ate them. They became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. When we take in God's word, it should cheer us up. And again, if you do not feel better knowing that God loves you, then check your pulse, check your attitude. Something is wrong. If you don't believe that God's word coming to you, whether through your ears, in the sermon, in the reading of the scriptures, in the words of the absolution, coming to you in word and water and baptism or in God's word then granting you the body and blood of Jesus in Holy Communion. If God's word doesn't come to you and you don't embrace it, don't take it in, don't inwardly digest it, then something's wrong. We don't have to laugh and jump and hop around the church and giggle outright at all the good things we hear from God, but if we don't leave God's house feeling better about ourselves, knowing how much we are loved, and either the person standing in front of you is doing something wrong or you're doing something wrong. Because when God's word comes to you, it should be your joy. No matter what happened to you through the week, no matter what you're dreading in the week to come, God loves you. He cares for you. He sent people like Jeremiah to remind his people to come back to him because he wanted to do good things for them. He doesn't want to hurt them. He doesn't want to punish them. He doesn't like opening up the ground and swallowing people. He doesn't like sending snakes to bite them. He does those things to rein his people in, to curb gross outbreaks of evil, and to give an example of those who are standing on the sidelines. But that's what happens to sinners. Jeremiah is called by God's name. And he says, I didn't sit in the company of revelers. I'm not a party boy. Cut me some slack, God. I'm alone because you've called me apart from everybody else. He talks about unceasing pain and incurable wound. He's probably talking about a wound of the spirit. Not some open, festering sore, but rather... It hurts when everybody is hating you, when everybody is calling you names, when everybody is saying, go away, Jeremiah, we don't want to hear you. If people treat you like that, that wound will fester. That wound will ache. That wound will keep you up at night. And he wants it gone. And he's looking at God as he says, like a deceitful brook, a desert stream that it's full of water, and all of a sudden it's bone dry again. Y'all pumped me up, y'all made me feel good, and where are you now? But yet he knows. The Lord has called him back. And as he speaks to Jeremiah, Jeremiah is also speaking to his audience and to us. If you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. First of all, setting up the prophet who is ready to call it a day. Say, nope. You've got to keep going. And I'm going to keep you going. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. And yes, you're not one of God's prophets. You're not Jeremiah or Isaiah or any of the other. But God has also called you to take his words out into the world into your home and among your family and friends, in town and wherever else. God gave you his word. And you act as God's mouth when you speak as a Christian, even if you're not speaking things from the Bible. When you speak in truth, when you speak in love, when you speak in concern for others, as a believer, that is part of then God speaking through you. Because God's love for people isn't just and only the forgiveness of sins through Jesus but it is keeping this world spinning. It is keeping food on tables. It is keeping families together. It is keeping friends close and cherishing each other. All of it is a gift from God. And when we realize this and we, we act like this and speak like this, we are carrying the things of God into our lives for the benefit of others. God then tells him, though, especially... They're going to turn to you. They're going to start listening, but you don't turn to them. He's putting Jeremiah back out there in the front lines saying, 
If they come to you, fine. If they turn their backs on you, fine. Whatever you do, don't follow their lead because their lead is taking them all to destruction. Don't give in and don't give up. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Keep speaking my word. And he talks then how he's going to make Jeremiah a fortified wall of bronze. They're going to throw themselves against him in their anger. They're angry at Jeremiah because they can't get to God. They're angry at Jeremiah because he won't let them forget their sins. And he won't let them forget that judgment is coming. Well, you can hate any good preacher for that at one time or another because, again, sinners deserve and will receive everlasting condemnation from God unless they repent, unless they believe in Jesus as their Savior. Some audiences are accustomed to hearing that. And they, yeah, I'm a sinner, but so are all these other people. And then we focus a little bit more on the sinners around us. But the important sinner to focus on is the one whose skin you are wearing, whose heart beats within you. Doesn't matter about all the other sinners right now hearing God's word. How do you hear God's word? How do you receive God's word? How do you act on God's word? It should hurt to be reminded that the reason you're in church isn't for a social club, isn't to do this thing or that thing out of joy, but it's first of all to receive the forgiveness of sins. Then all the other blessings flow. But if you aren't in God's house, among God's people, listening to a sermon, receiving the supper, first of all, for your forgiveness, for your life, for your salvation, then again, you're doing church wrong. And you're doing your pastor wrong, but most of all, you're doing God wrong because he calls you to repent, he calls you to believe, he calls you to be saved. We also see something else in Jeremiah. We see somebody who is modeling what's going to happen to Jesus. But even more so. People are going to turn against Jesus. People are going to despise Jesus. He's going to have to stand firm. And there's nobody going to be joining him there at the end, is there? Peter's bold for a moment, but then when Jesus tells him to put away the sword, he cuts and runs with the rest of them. In fact, Peter just doesn't get it through that entire time. Last week's gospel, you're the Christ today. You can't do that, Jesus. Don't receive Jesus that way. If you say amen to one thing he says, then say amen to everything he says. Because he's doing it all for a purpose, which is your salvation, your life, your joy. We see how Jeremiah talks about these things. Jesus sort of sums them up on the cross, doesn't he? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It can come to that. Confessing God's truth and living as one of his people can have consequences. Jeremiah embraces them as the Lord supports him. Knowing that he's still preparing the way for the one God is sending, but not knowing any of the details that we have now. But he feels the pain. He knows the loneliness and the sorrow and the suffering. And in that, he knows a little bit about what it's like to be the one who is coming to save him. And you and me and all people. The Lord tells Jeremiah, I am with you to save you and deliver you. And the Lord tells you the same thing. He is with you. Health problems, he may take them away. He may help you to live with them. Money problems, family problems, the same way. Sometimes God takes away our problems, our woes and our worries. Sometimes he says, deal with it because I'm there with you. You don't go it alone. In fact, the harder it gets, the more God carries and supports and loves you. I am with you to save you and deliver you. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. The world tries to get its hooks into you. It tries to drag you down. It tries to get you to admit that they are just as good as you are. They are their way of thinking, their way of acting, their way of believing is just fine and dandy. 
You can have your truth, they'll have theirs, but you have one truth, the truth. But the world doesn't. Nobody wants to hear the absolute unless it's their absolute. But there is no true absolute besides our God and his word. And he invites you to taste it, to eat it, to see that it is good, to take it in, to do as the colleague says, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest, to take it to heart and let it go throughout your body, your mind, and your spirit. Let that delicious, tasty word norm every one of your thoughts, every one of your words, and every one of your deeds. Be joyful because God loves you. And if other people love you, fine. If they don't, God still loves you. God cares for you, whether lots of people do or nobody does. And God wants you to be his, not just for this wandering through life for however many years we get, but through the eternity that's yet to come. He wants you healthy. He wants you happy. He wants you whole. And in Jesus, that is his gift to you. Taste it. Chew on it. Swallow it. Let it fill you with love, with life, and with peace. Your words came to me, and I ate them, Jeremiah says. God's not going to make you eat your words, your nasty, vile words of sin. Rather, he's going to let you eat his words in preaching, in teaching, in the sacrament, so that you then will have new words coming out of you, words of life and love and joy. God grant you a hearty appetite for his word and a hearty love for your neighbor. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace that surpasses understanding keep you in Christ Jesus. Amen.